dear all today we have the afon school scheduled for image guidance in radiotherapy the next frontiers and we have four eminent speakers from peter mackellum australia and our moderator sufla kanchongkam from thailand she is she has an illustrious career in medical physics starting from early 2004 and currently she is a lecturer and medical physicist in the medical physics program department of diagnostic and therapeutic radiology faculty of medicine ramathi bodhi hospital mahidol university bangkok thailand over to you sufelek okay so um thank you professor mary john for the introduction Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to AFOM School webinar. I'm honored to be part of this educational session. Today, uh, we have four honor speakers from the Peter McCollum Cancer Center, Australia, leading by Professor Thomas Cron, the Director of Physical Science. They will be sharing us various aspect of the next frontier of image guidance in radiotherapy. And we also have a Q and A session. So the audience can post any questions in the chat box. Our speaker will join the discussion at the end. Uh, and now I would like to invite Professor Khan, who will provide an overview of the entire panel. Please welcome him. Professor Khan, please. Could you please? Yes, my my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. I couldn't find the uh, mute button. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good night. Wherever you are, uh, welcome to this summer school, and uh, I'm very happy uh, to uh, in introduce the summer school as such. Uh, we don't have summer here in Aust Australia. It's actually a miserable day here, uh, with a lot of rain uh, where we are. Uh, but we enjoy that, and we enjoy it even more, uh, having the opportunity to share uh, these a couple of uh, ideas and thoughts uh, with you in the next. Uh, Two hours, roughly. Uh, what I might do is I might just quickly share my screen uh, uh, with you uh, and introduce Peter McCallum Cancer Center and the ideas uh, really behind these summer schools. So here we go. You should be able to see now my screen, uh, basically saying welcome to the AFOMP summer school uh, school here. Uh, let me know if, if that is not the case, and I'm just going here to full screen. Excellent. So uh, welcome to that. And you can see here a picture of Peter McCallum Cancer Center. Uh, as such, this is the, the program, uh, and uh, we will lead you through this as we go through this. These are the speakers, and I'm really, really grateful to AFOM uh, and Dof, uh, Dr. Sufalak uh, for uh, allowing us to speak here. This school is really part of a whole series of schools, and I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to join some of the other schools from Peter Mac. Uh, we started off with physics in external beam radiotherapy in 2021, uh, and uh, then talked about special techniques, and particularly stereotactic treatments. This is sort of delivery. The, obvious next frontier would be image guidance. And that's clearly something which is very close to my heart and all our heart, because it really allows us uh, to make this, the physic, the external beam radiotherapy, uh, and particularly stereotactic, uh, actually possible as such. This is Peter McCallum, Ca oh no, unfortunately, no, that's not Peter McCallum Cancer Center. Uh, this is Can Peter McCallum Cancer Center in, in Melbourne. Uh, and uh, we consist of five campuses, have 16 linear accelerators, one gamma knife, and a whole variety uh, of uh, other Uh, 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 treatment units. Uh, we are really very fortunate uh, that uh, we have been equipped well by our state government. We are a public hospital, not a private hospital, uh, and as such, uh, try to combine research and service. What I'd like to particularly take uh, put get your attention to is that we are organized in tumor streams. That basically means that uh, within the cancer center, we cluster people who are interested in the same tumor streams. For example, I am uh, supporting the breast cancer and lung cancer uh, tumor streams. Uh, and in this context, I work with medical oncologists, radiologists, uh, physicists, physicians, and of course, radiation oncologists. Uh, uh, 
with uh, together and that allows the physicists to specialize a bit more and allows us to try and address the needs clinicians and patients have uh, maybe a bit better. Peter McCallum Cancer Center works on uh, five campuses uh, and we have people from different campuses presenting uh, throughout this series as, as such uh, and uh, we try to have, despite the fact that the center has six linear accelerators and the others somewhat less, we try to make sure that the patient experience wherever they enter Peter Mac is the same. But I will drop my presentation now and hand over uh, back uh, to uh, Dr. Sufalak uh, to introduce the first speaker of our team, Dr. Nikard Carson. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Professor Klon, for the introduction. Next, uh, let me introduce the next, the first speaker, Dr. Nick Harkasso. He holds a PhD in radio biological optimization and interface dosimetry from the University of Wollongong. Then he completed the postdoctoral post research with the University of Wisconsin Medicine and clinical radiotherapy physics training at Peter McCormick Cancer Center. Clearly, he served as medical physicist and research lead focusing on research areas such as SBRT, applied radiation therapy, and the utilization of functional imaging in radiation therapy. Today, his topic is the motion management. Please welcome him. Please, Nick. Yeah, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak to you all today. And um, I hope you find this talk useful. Um, so I'm going to be talking about respiratory motion management in radiation therapy. Uh, and uh, please feel free to email me anytime if you have any questions or discussions um, leading on from this. So just to disclose, we do receive funding from Barry Medical Systems and Reflection Medical for research into Sabre. And I am a consultant with a company called Sea Trip Medical, which does have some motion management interests. So the learning objectives of this, uh, this talk are to describe the various respiratory motion management options, so how they work, what benefits they provide, and a bit of a summary of the, the literature. Uh, and I want people to be able to identify the pros and cons of each respiratory motion management option with regards to patient and technical factors. So hopefully by the end of this, uh, you're able to figure out which motion management options work best for, for you in your department and for your patients. And just to point out, I won't be talking about deep inspiration breath hold for, for cardiac sparing in breast radiotherapy. This is more about um, managing respiratory motion of the tumor. So I really like this figure from this paper, which is now 15 years old, uh, which was um, in the context of mid-ventilation. And, and this really gives a nice summary of the different uh, margins uh, that are applied in uh, when, when using different motion management approaches. And so this is our traditional free breathing approach here, where we have a 3D CT, uh, which is a snapshot of our tumor, which is moving with respiration at some random phase of the breathing cycle. And we have to add some large margins um, to account for our uncertainty in, in detecting where that is and where it might be while we're turning the beam on. And then our next iteration is moving to what we call the internal target volume, um, which is an ICIU definition. And this is where we actually have a, a good measurement of where the tumor or a good estimate of where the tumor is during the respiratory cycle typically acquired using 4D CT. And we put a margin around that describing or covering everywhere the tumor goes with respiration. And then we have a smaller PTV on top of that. Uh, so we're treating the, the respiratory motion um, like with, with a systematic correction there. We then have breath hold and tracking and gating. And these are all things that we can do um, to alter either the beam delivery or the patient's respiratory state and turn the beam on only in specific respiratory states. And what this means is the tumor is typically uh, not moving a lot um, and we have much smaller uh, internal target volume to account for that motion while the beam is on and then a, a PTV margin. And then we have our mid ventilation approach, which I'll cover briefly as well, where we pick the most likely position of the tumor 
as based off of 4D CT. That's a time weighted position. And then we account for that with a, um, a, a margin uh, to account for where it might be going during the respiratory cycle. And this one relies on, on the tumor being able to leave the, the margin for a small amount of time and that not really being a, a, of much dosimetric impact. I'm gonna turn internal target volume and mid ventilation or mid position um, passive motion management, because essentially we're just measuring where the tumor might be going with respiratory motion and putting a margin on to account for that. And then I'm gonna call this breath hold tracking and gating and active motion management, because we're actively doing something to our beam delivery or to the respiratory state of the patient uh, to minimize our margins. So what is the goal of motion management? And there is no one goal for motion management. There are lots of different reasons we might do this. So one of the primary things we do this for, particularly when we're treating things that are moving with respiration, um, is to ensure that we're actually hitting the target as it does move with respiration, because we don't want our tumor moving out of our treatment fields while we're treating it. So we wanna be able to, to measure where it's going and account for it. We might want to do some, some motion management and, and maybe even active motion management to reduce the respiratory motion, which will reduce our treatment volume via reductions in margin. And that goes hand in hand with reducing uh, dose to adjacent critical organs, which might become um, be, be in, our, in our margins um, if we have to treat a larger, larger volume. We also might want to move the target away from adjacent critical organs or previously treated regions, because when we take a deep breath in, for example, uh, things move inferiorly in the thorax, and that might move our tumor away from something like the heart or from, a, from an area of the lung we might have previously treated. So we can use these maneuvers to give us some separation. And we also, um, do benefit from, from motion management when we're looking at IGRT because if things are static during our image guidance, then quite often they're a lot easier to see. We don't have that motion blur, uh, which, which blows out our, our soft tissue definition in our cone beam CTs, for example. So really what I want you to think about is when you're applying motion management, what are we actually trying to do for this particular patient? Is it reducing just the total overall volume we treat? Is it trying to avoid an adjacent critical organ such as a loop of bowel? Is it moving a structure away from another critical organ? Or are we just trying to see, say, a very small lung tumor better? So it's important to consider why you're doing uh, motion management. Just to cover uh, passive motion management, I'm gonna um, cover internal target volume in probably the most detail, because this is the most commonly used um, way of, of accounting for respiratory motion. So this is an ICRU, ICRU target volume which is defined as an optional volume as the CTV plus an internal margin, which takes into account uncertainties in size, shape, and position of the CTV within the patient. So the ITV is used typically to account for the motion of the tumor as it moves while the beam is on. Uh, and it can also be used to um, encompass uncertainty with re reproducibility of breath hold, for example, if you've got um, some measurement of the reproducibility of how well a patient can hold their breath, you can use a margin to account for that or how much something is moving within a gating window. Uh, in tumor tracking, the ITV is used to account for the uncertainty in the correlation between your, your tumor and your whatever your surrogate you're using, such as a fiducial marker. And in the case the CTV is used, and an ITV can be challenging to define, so quite often we'll see something called an IGTV used, which is actually everywhere that the GTV is going through um, the respiratory cycle. So typically this is what happens. We have a 4D CT. Uh, if we just zoom in on this, and this is moving with respiration, we'll then draw an ITV, which is covering everywhere the tumor is going with respiration. And then we'll put a PTV margin on top of that. And that's where, what we treat. So everywhere the tumor is going during respiration, we'll be covering it with our beam. A subtle adjustment to that concept is, is the mid-ventilation approach. And what this um, is, is where you have a 4D CT, um, which might look like this, and you compute what is the, the most likely position of the tumor during the respiratory cycle. And typically that's somewhere between inhale and exhale, usually more weighted towards exhale. So where is 
um, ba based on a time, um, a phase bin 4 CT, what's the most likely position? And you draw that, and then you apply a margin, which is typically um, a third of the tumor motion. Um, and, and that accounts for where it is, um, for, for, for where it might be um, moving during the, the respiratory cycle while your beam is on. And by doing this, you're exploiting um, the, the, the margin recipe because you're, you're really um, uh, re reducing the, um, the, the systematic error, which is one of the dominant components. And it does rely on, you know, th this means that you're not actually covering the, the tumor everywhere it goes during respiration. It does dip out of your margins, but it relies on the fact that it only dips out for a very small amount of time. And when it does go out um, in lung, typically the penumbra is wide enough that it still gets high enough dose. So this is used um, in a few um, centers in Europe and, and they have roughly equivalent results to, to what we get with ITVs. It does require a bit more work to achieve this though. And the, the biggest gains you get, so if we just consider online IGRT, because this is what most of us are doing when, when using um, these margins, uh, typically you start to see gains um, um, when using an, a mid-ventilation approach when you get above about five or 10 millimetres of respiratory motion compared with an ITV approach. So I'm just gonna move now on to active motion management. So the first thing um, we need when we're doing active motion management at the time of treatment is we need some measurement of the respiratory signal. And I've just put a couple of examples here. Um, this is the, the Varian um, RGSC, um, which is a block, which is, has some, some little markers on there, which are picked up by an external camera. And this sits on the abdomen, gives you a, a respiratory trace signal. This is the surface tracking, which we're gonna hear a lot about uh, in, in the subsequent talks, which, which looks at the patient's surface and gives you some sort of signal um, associated with their respiration. And these provide some correlation um, between your image data or your treatment data. So basically we want to figure out what is happening um, or, or use this as a surrogate for what is happening within the patient, what our tumor is doing. Uh, and and, um, and that, that allows us to, to gate our imaging or a treatment beam. Placement can be important and it's important to keep it consistent. For example, if you're using a respiratory marker, um, a respiratory gating marker block, um, it's good to keep that on exactly the same position between simulation and all, and all treatment sessions. And it's quite important to use image guidance to, to validate that whatever signal you're, you're um, recording is a good surrogate for the tumor position. And, and quite often we'll use um, planar fluoroscopy on the treatment unit. Uh, or 4D comb beam CT or these sorts of tools to make sure that when we think the, the patient is at ex exhale based on our external surrogate, the patient that the tumor is actually at the exhale position we think it is. So it's really important that to use this combination of image guidance and this external surrogate to validate that, that um, assumption. So one of the, 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 the simplest and most brute force ways of doing um, that active motion management is abdominal compression. And, and this is where we um, compress physically the upper abdomen to physically limit the diaphragm motion. And this is typically a compression plate like this, which, which screws down and compresses the abdomen that sits under the ribs here, uh, or a compression um, band, which wraps around the patient and you tighten it. And then there's a bladder that you, you pump up full of air to a certain pressure. The contraindications for this are patient comfort. Some patients don't really um, uh, tolerate it very well or if they've got a stoma bag, and sometimes it can limit beam angles depending on what your compression device is made of. And this reduces motion, not eliminates motion. So you, do, you still do need to have a measurement of, a, of the respiratory motion with this because it doesn't um, completely eliminate motion. Uh, and, and you still need to do set, for example, a 4D CT to, to, to make sure you're measuring and accounting for that motion, that residual motion with the margin. Um, you get some reasonable gains. So this, um, these are a few papers here. So this, if we just concentrate on the, the craniocaudal direction from this paper, which is using an abdominal compression plate, each dot is a, um, is a patient. So this is the excursion. This is how much motion there is in free breathing. This is how much there is with um, compression. You can see a reasonable reduction. Uh, and similarly here, this is a compression band. This is a histogram of the the uh, craniocaudal motion, and you can see there's a shift from the, the, the filled in black lines to this um, uh, em empty lines here. 
uh, showing there's a, a shift in in the amplitude from from the these these numbers here, which are relatively large to to um to, to these lower numbers, which give you a reasonable reduction in your margin. It's important to read these with a grain of salt, though, because quite often they'll report these numbers in the patients that abdominal compression worked, and they don't actually um, count the patients where it didn't do anything. And I think that's an important point to make because um, in our own data, and this is it here, um, each dot is a patient. This is the liver dome motion um, in the superior inferior direction in free breathing. And this is it in, with abdo compression. We have a number of patients for whom abdominal compression didn't really do anything at all. Um, and so it's not really worth the, the discomfort for the patient and, and the extra work to put it on. We have some patients where it made a massive gain. And so it's really important that we look at um, the, the abdominal compression on a per patient basis and make sure that it is working for this particular patient. It's also important um, to place it in the, in the correct location. This is a really nice study where they looked at um, quite a, quite a number of patients who had the compression plate at different positions um, in the abdomen from right up underneath the ribs to quite low down more towards the pelvis. And this data really showed that you have to have the the compression plate as high up as possible under the ribs to really limit that diaphragm motion. If it's quite low down like this, you don't really get any gain from the abdominal compression. You can also get some compression um, effect with a, what we call the elector body fix and drape, which is a vacuum bag. This is quite um, time consuming to put on. I think on a good day, it's about 10, 10 to 15 minutes extra to put this on. Um, but we have um, measured some reduction, reductions in respiratory motion when using this abdominal compression, or this, this whole body um, compression drape. So moving on to breath hold, which is a really, um, a really common um, technique for, for motion management and active motion management. Um, so this is where the patient holds their breath. And this, this is typically based on audio and or visual instructions and feedback. It can be an inhale, a deep inhale or exhale, depending on the intent, what you're trying to get out of your motion management. And the idea of this that you, is that you get static anatomy during your imaging and treatment. So this means you don't have any motion artifacts in planning or your treatment imaging. Your ITV starts to approximate a CTV. And so you only need to account the, the breath hold reproducibility within an ITV. And there's minimal scope for interplay between the MLC and the tumor motion. So there are a couple of different ways to do breath hold, as I just mentioned. Um, inhale is typically easier for patients. Um, if you go to a random person in the street and say, hey, hold your breath, typically they'll take a, a deep breath in and hold it. Um, exhale is, um, for most people, a bit more unnatural. Um, so usually people can hold their breath longer at inhale, but it's important to consider that there is a bit more variation in inhale. And, and this is some really nice data. Um, BH 100% is inhale and 0% is exhale. So this is inhale all the way through to exhale. And this data is quite interesting because what it shows is that if we look at the breath hold duration, so inhale here and exhale, and this is a box plot of how long people could hold their breath. People can hold their breath a lot longer at, at inhale compared with exhale. You see a lot of people who can only hold it at say 30 seconds, um, whereas most people can hold it in this sample size. Um, for a full minute. Whereas if we go down here to what is the, um, the diaphragmatic motion or the pancreatic motion in this series, we find that people holding their breath at inhale are less reproducible compared with exhale. And if you consider looking at a respiratory trace, say for example, if you're looking at your 4 CT respiratory trace or, or RPM re, um, breathing trace, what you'll, what you'll notice is that most patients are returning to exactly the same exhale position so a relaxed exhale is actually a more reproducible position than, a, than an inhale breath hold. And there's quite a, a few papers which show a, show a similar thing that although you can hold your breath longer with inhale, um, in a number of patients, it's not as reproducible as exhale. So it's important to consider these, these things. So they might be able to hold their breath longer, but it might be moving around more, which means you have a larger margin to account for the inter-breath hold um, uh, position. What you get out of an inhale breath hold can be quite beneficial though. And this is a study, this is a randomized study from, um, from France quite a number of years ago where they looked at um, two methods of inhale breath hold. And this is total lung volume 
and they compared that with um, RPM, which was uh, gating the patient on exhale. And you can see the lung volume is way, way bigger when you're using an inhale breath hold compared with uh, treating an exhale. And so that means that all of your lung DVH parameters are much lower. And in this study, that actually resulted in a reduction in acute side effects. So there, there can be a key benefit there by doing an inhale breath hold. Uh, another benefit of inhale breath hold, which we've um, exploited in some patients, is we get a, a separation bet between our, our tumour and our heart. So this is a lung saber treat, uh, stereotactic ablative body treatment. And so this is a small lung tumour. And this is our heart here. This is our free breathing. So this is an average of a 40 CT. We can see sort of the blur of the heart, which is essentially everywhere the heart's going through the respiratory and cardiac cycle. And you can see there's not much separation between the tumour and the heart. In a deep inspiration, we had quite a large displacement here, which meant that, you know, when we're using very sharp dose gradients that we do use in Sabre, we could spare the heart quite a lot in this particular patient. Sorry, bit of a lag. Okay, this is a, a study from Miana Jespovic in Denmark, uh, and they did a, a prospective study looking at inhale breath hold. And it's worth just reviewing that there are some patients who are still not suitable for inhale breath hold um, in terms of consistency. Um, and they did a really nice quantification of how much variation they do get still between breath holds. Um, most patients are less than two millimeters in their sleep inf direction. But you do have some patients who are still having inter breath hold variations of up to five millimeters, which you do need to account for. You did need to be able to measure it and account for it in a margin. So if we move on to breath hold um, in exhale, um, and the, the aim here is to have the patient in a relaxed exhale. And so that the coaching and the instructions to the patient really need to be customized to that specific patient because some people respond differently to others. Some people, for example, have quite a, a slow, uh, relaxed exhale. And so you, you can wait for them to be in exhale and you just say, hold your breath there. Don't take another breath in. Other people have quite a, a fast respiratory trace and you might need to say, okay, um, breathe out and hold and give them a bit of warning. So it's important to have a few different coaching options up your, up your sleeve to um, try and figure out what works best for the patient and give them a number of different options if one isn't working and, and, and really figure out what works best for that patient. And sometimes it's quite important to also have consistent staff coaching that patient because they do build up a bit of a relationship between um, their instructions and how the patient reacts to that. Exhale does result in the smallest lung volume, so you won't get much of a gain in your lung DVH. You'll get a small gain um, from, from a reduction of margin compared with, say, an ITV, but your lung volume is typically the smallest. But as I mentioned before, it's potentially a lot more reproducible. This is a, a very nice study from um, a, a group here in Melbourne where they did a, a study in liver patients with liver tumours and they actually gave each patient, um, did some fluoroscopy on each patient using deep inspiration, inspiration, or expiration breath hold. And they quantified the reproducibility. So when they hold their breath, is the liver in the same position between subsequent breath holds and stability. Once they're in that breath hold, how much is the liver moving? And what they showed was that um, it's useful to have a bit of a range of options to play with because some patients are better with DIBH, some patients are better with inhale breath hold, and some patients are better with exhale, depending on um, their, their own uh, comfort levels and what they're used to. So it's really important when talking about breath hold, have a think about what are you trying to achieve with this breath hold? Is it larger lung volumes? Is it stable anatomy? Are you just trying to reduce your treatment volume? Think about the aims of what you're doing with your breath hold and what might be more suitable. And then what's best for the patient? Can they do an inhale breath hold, but not an exhale? In that case, it might be, might be better to do an inhale. So really have a think about um, patient factors and what you're trying to achieve with it. Lastly, um, forced breath hold is um, typically what we call the, the um, ABC device, um, which is, um, 
an elective product where it's a, a, a nozzle here and the patient breathes through this filtration system. And um, when they're in the desired respiratory phase, the radiation therapist press pause and the patient can't breathe anymore through that and it holds them in position. They do have this trigger here where they can release it if they want and the beam will turn off. But this can be potentially more reproducible than voluntary breath hold because it's based on tidal volume of the lungs. So potentially it's more reproducible. There is a bit of a um, patient acceptance challenge here compared with, with voluntary breath hold though. Um, if we move on to free breathing respiratory gating, the, the, the beauty of this method is that the patient jumps on the couch and they don't need to do anything different to what they do usually. They jump on the couch and they breathe. So what we look for here is we put a patient on the couch and we put the surrogate on there. Usually in our clinic, it's the RGSC block and we just monitor their normal breathing. And if the patient is, is, is like this, where they've got a nice um, exhale phase, which sits at exactly the same position between subsequent breaths, and it stays at exhale for a reasonable duration, then we might consider them a good candidate for um, exhale gating. And what this means is the yellow is where our beam would turn on or where our imaging would turn on. So each time the patient breathes out, our beam turns on. And our duty cycle, we usually aim for about 25 to 30% and above. Um, and the nice thing about this is the patient doesn't need to, to, to do anything different that, um, compared with breath hold where they, they might be quite challenging them for them to follow instructions and get it quite right. This is potentially a lot more relaxing for them. Um, so we are using this quite a bit. Exhale phase is, is the most consistent and usually the longest duration. You know, gating on the inhale phase, you can see here the peaks are slightly different heights here. So we'd have some different levels um, and a bit more variation. So usually we're doing on an exhale phase. And the balance you've got to, to figure out here is reduction in amplitude within the gating window and a sufficient duty cycle. Because as you can imagine, you can bring this, this gating window here down to as tight as possible to minimize residual motion. But um, that would result in, in a very short duty cycle. Your treatment will take a very long time. So typically we'll, we'll sort of do that balance and minimize it to two to three millimeters of motion um, while giving us a, a good duty cycle. And we often use uh, fluoroscopy to figure out uh, what a good window is. Uh, and this is what some, some imaging looks like with some fiducial markers um, uh, in, in, the, in the respiratory gating scheme. Uh, Real-time tracking is, is something a bit more advanced that uh, most of us don't have access to. And this is potentially the optimal solution for all patients but it's also the most uh, technologically challenging. And the idea of this is the patients lie on the couch, they breathe how they breathe, there's no instruction needed for them. And the, there's some measurement of the uh, respiratory position. Um, you know, this, this is just using an infrared marker in the Accuray uh, CyberNav system, the patient's wearing a vest and that's used as a surrogate for, for the respiratory cycle. And this robotic um, just tracks it as, it as the patient breathes. And then you need some image guidance during the um, acquisition to uh, uh, to make sure that the target is a reasonable um, reasonable accuracy, uh, a reasonably accurate measurement of the um, of the tumor. And so, for example, in the CyberKnife system, you have some fluoroscopy of some fiducial markers, which updates your respiratory correlation model between your surrogate and uh, your your tumor. Um, periodically, typically every 20 to 30 seconds. So the nice thing here is you don't have this duty cycle loss that you have in free breathing gating. The beam is always on and the patient doesn't need to follow any instructions. They just get on the couch and breathe how they breathe. Um, you do need a signal of where the tumour is in real time, but you also need a prediction algorithm because there's always a lag between the measurement of your signal and the beam um, being able to change. And the prediction algorithm, as you can imagine, will do better with more reproducible breathing. So your surrogate and your, your accuracy is a bit better when you've got more reproducibility um, in your respiratory trace. And, uh, effectively, this will remove the motion, which is similar to, to, to breath hold. Um, so depending on what you're trying to achieve, this will have mixed impact on the organs at risk. 
in, in a study I was involved with using MLC tracking for lung uh, saber. Um, here's our reductions in PTV. So this is the PTV volume when using an ITV based approach. And this is the MLC tracking PTV. And you can see there's modest gains, modest reductions in our, in our PTV volume here. One of the key things you do get out of that though, is there's more consistent um, uh, delivery. So our, our GTV um, uh, minimum dose and near maximum was more consistent when using our MLC tracking. Uh, so there's there's a gain in our lung uh, DVHs, but also you do get a higher consistency in your tumor doses, which can be important. Lastly, I just wanted to point out the impact of motion management on treatment time. And this is data from our own center where we looked at the treatment time, which would be defined as a time from the first IGRT image uh, to the end of the last treatment beam in minutes. So that's the vertical axis. And we looked at how long each fraction of our liver SBRT treatments was taking. So each dot here is a fraction. So we had about 610 fractions from our liver SPRT cohort, and we split it up into what motion management was used. So free breathing, abdominal compression, exhale breath hold, and free breathing gating. And you can see that the dominant form of motion management we use for our liver SBRT is exhale breath hold. We're able to get about 70 to 80% of our patients in that. Uh, and then we use a, a mix of others. Gating is actually becoming a fair bit more common now. Um, but what I want to point out is if you just consider the median treatment time, median fraction time for free breathing and abdominal compression, it's around 25 to 30 minutes for a fraction size of, of about 7 to um, 15 gray, depending on the prescription. And when we go to exhale breath hold or gating, we're more like 40 minutes for our, our fraction time. And so that's not an insignificant increase in treatment time. And if you consider these patients are on the couch holding their breath, um, the longer they're on the couch and if they've got their arms up, it can be more challenging um, the longer they're on the bed to maintain a consistent exhale breath hold, for example, if they're in pain with their shoulders. So you do need to be able to pick the right motion management um, for, uh, for that patient. If there's someone who's quite uncomfortable and a lot of pain, um, exhale breath hold might not be optimal for them because they're gonna, if they're going to be on the couch for a long time, um, it might be a struggle for them to hold their breath consistently, which is going to prolong the treatment time even further and, get, and make them more uncomfortable and, and stressed out. Um, we do find that the image guidance is a big contributor to the long fraction times because when we're doing exhale breath hold or when we're doing free breathing gating, we're also doing cone beams that are exhale breath hold or a free breathing gating cone beam. And so that prolongs the time of our IGRT as well as the treatment time. So we do need to consider this and essentially the number of cone beams we take, um, the treatment time scales linearly with this. Each cone beam we take in this scenario adds about seven minutes of treatment, uh, seven minutes on the couch to these patients. And so this means we're really starting to utilize things like triggered imaging, uh, which is planar imaging during the treatment beam to really make sure that our tumor is in the right position while our beam is on. And that saves us having to do a mid-treatment cone beam CT, for example, uh, to make sure the patient's in the, in the consistent position. So utilizing any imaging that we have available on our treatment machines um, at any time we can. And you know, um, exact track is another example of this just to make to, to minimize the, the use of volu volumetric imaging uh, during treatment. So we, we only do uh, the volumetric imaging at the start of treatment, for example. So it's, 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 it's useful. I think there's a, a clear role for here for, for planar imaging to improve the efficiency of, of treatments. So to summarize, motion management selection depends on what you're aiming to achieve with motion management. And it's very useful to have multiple options available so you can customize this to the patient. And that's the patient condition, how they react to your instructions, for example, and what you're trying to achieve. Advanced motion management or active motion management can substantially increase treatment time. So this must be balanced with patient condition and, and what you're trying to achieve with the treatment. Uh, thanks, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Nick, um, for the uh, comprehensive talk about the motion management. Again, if the participant have the question or comment, you may put in the chat box. So right now, may I move to the second topic presented by Mr. Deepak Bosala. Mr. Deepak Bosala is a senior medical physicist at the 
at the Peter McCoram Cancer Center with a lot of experience in commissioning, QA, and implementation of new technology in radiation therapy. Recently, he led the commissioning of surface, guide, surface guided radiation therapy system across our Peter Mac uh, campus. Today, he will share us with the topic of surface guidance, commissioning, and QA. Please uh, depart. Could you please turn, turn on the microphone? Okay. Uh, could you please turn on the microphone, Mr. Depart? Is okay. it better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your kind introduction, Dr. Supalak. Um, it's great to be here today, and thanks for your invite. So today I'm going to present on a guidance about commissioning and QA of a optical surface guided radiation therapy system. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, here's my email and please feel free to email anytime in future as well. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owner of the land on which we meet virtually today. And I would also like to pay my respect to elders past and present. Here's my disclosure. Uh, and I must admit that I have the experience with uh, Vision RT product only, um, mainly Align RT. So a little bit about the surface guided radiotherapy at Peter Mac. So as Thomas already showed you, we are geographically located within the Victoria state uh, in Australia and have a five campus. Uh, as you can see in the map here, so four of them are in a metropolitan Melbourne region and one in a regional center in Bendigo. Uh, we started our SGRT journey in 2021 uh, with our first system clinical in August, uh, August uh, 2021. Uh, with a few months later, we added um, another system. So between September 20. 21 to July 2022, we added three more systems across two campus. So the first one was Melbourne campus, then moved to Moravian campus. Uh, then we were really lucky to get six more systems at the end of 2022 across all our campuses. So now in total, we have 10 systems, uh, additional three more offline workstation where you can preview your patient without clinical interruption. So the first three systems were the early install were three uh, generation five high definition camera uh, and uh, the the rest seven system were horizon camera, which is the newer version or updated version provided from Vision RT. So we've been uh, so we use the Alan RT advanced version six point four software and. Um, we treat a range of clinical sites that you will um, hear from the next presenter in the next talk. So what's about surface guided radiation therapy? I think it has become quite popular lately uh, because um, it offers uh, quite a lot of um, advantages, uh, such as it uh, provides improved patient experience uh, that you can treat uh, tattoo-less treatment. Uh, so no, no tattoos on a, or a permanent mark on a patient. Uh, it replaces uh, traditional laser-based three reference mark to thousands of surface information uh, that uh, you can more accurately rely on and deliver your treatment uh, through intrafraction monitoring of the patient surface motion um, by automatically interrupting beam uh, during treatment if the surface moves outside predefined tolerance. Uh, and so the, the most important thing is this system adds no imaging, no, no dose to the patients. So, the, so it also offers improved staff workload by offering more efficient setup to our patients and, uh, through reduced manual handling. Obviously, that helped to increase your um, uh, uh, throughput. It allows to treat complex cases uh, where if you have the claustrophobic patient with a mask or you know quite movable patients, then if if that patient warrants a, a treatment, uh, you know in a setting such as palliative, uh, 
then you can still accurately hit the target uh, provided, you know, there could be a lot of beam interruption because you set your tolerance on a SGRD system, but it is possible. And also uh, this potential, uh, you reduce the imaging, so verification imaging. Uh, you, you don't, uh, you don't reduce, uh, you don't make that decision, but I think in practice, when you set up using SGRD system and when the patients are set up in the treatment unit closer to the plant position and, and perform your verification imaging, you probably see a lot less uh, shift data that you don't need to apply corrections uh, or even if uh, they always often fall within that clinical tolerance you set so that you don't need to repeat another verification imaging. So it's really um, uh, advantageous uh, and saves time. So the objective of my talk today is I'm going to focus on commissioning of uh, SGRT system and the, mm, the second half uh, will be focused on the quality assurance uh, of the mm, uh, program of the SGRT system. So obviously commissioning in, includes testing systems capabilities and verifying its accuracy, precision in all clinically relevant scenarios. Uh, the commissioning phase also includes identifying systems limitation uh, where it performs optimally and, and you document uh, the initial system character performance characteristics. Uh, this is usually done by medical physics and medical physics team and you, you need to consult with vendors when needed if you see any anomalies or any discrepancies uh, and you always go ask another center who has more experience. That's what we did um, at our center when we first installed the system. Uh, this is the another opportunity. This is the real opportunity where you develop or define your clinical uh, workflows uh, in a clear way. You understand all the limitations. So this is really about uh, physicists time to learn about ins and outs of the system. The, the quality assurance program, uh, which should be specific to clinical need and, and what resources you have. Uh, so in order to set up the program, you choose a set of uh, tests from commissioning test uh, and um, periodically evaluate the system's performance, uh, how much it deviates from uh, the expected value during commissioning. They need to be compliant to your local regulations, um, uh, look, uh, institutional policies, uh, and you, yeah, and have a clear, the, the program, QA program should have a clear um, instruction on what to, what action you take when your QA fails. So where do we begin? So to begin commissioning, so I think I would suggest to, to look at uh, key literature. So this list is very short. It is not many I put it in, uh, but uh, AAPMTG 147, uh, that's the commissioning for non-radiographic localization system, sets the foundation and provides guidance to the community. Uh, the newer TG302 report that was um, published last year uh, provides guidance on QA and commissioning of, for physicists focusing on SGRD system only. And this is also uh, an element it adds or the risk-based uh, approach it follows. So it integrates the risk-based uh, TG100 uh, into it. Uh, so there's a, another latest document uh, that was also published around last year, uh, is an astro ACROP guide, guideline on surface-guided uh, radiation therapy, uh, which is really good. It gives a lot of um, prescriptive ta uh, tables to do uh, with a really nice descriptions. So, Additionally, the, you can find a lot of good um, resources uh, from users uh, on this um, SGRD community website. So I would highly recommend you to go through that as well uh, when, when you are commissioning a system. So looking at commissioning, the, this, the, there is a mainly, you know, you need to look at the test based on uh, the recommendations. Then you follow end-to-end -end, uh, testing. Uh, that, that, that's really to refine the processes to understand um, uh, the, the, the workflow works well. Uh, 
and uh, you always include there that sites you are intending to utilize as CRT. So, um, so that's really another key aspects of commissioning and have a documentation, a proper documentation. It doesn't need to be, you know, very large and elaborative, but uh, depending upon who you communicating that document to, like like let's say if it's a physicist uh, communicating to the radiation therapist, you have the just a tick box uh, saying you know this text done, this text done. These are the systems limitations. Uh, if it's for a physics record, then you have a comprehensive commissioning report that I'll briefly go later. Have the test results and all the procedure documented as well as. Uh, but this is the opportunity during commissioning that you provide staff training and you know ensure they are up to date uh, with the use of the systems so they are properly credentialed as well to use you know use the system to treat patients so looking at uh, apm tg302 so it refers back to uh, 140 tg140 report uh, for the test list. Uh, so this table here, sorry, I, I may not have the data pointer. And so this table here is, yeah, there's a lot of text, but I put uh, some of the key things, most of the things uh, in the list here that will go one by one. So most importantly, this test kind of follows after the acceptance of the system. So two things you wanna really look at is, is your machine isocenter. Uh, is correct. Uh, you know, you make sure you test that uh, before you moving to SGRT. So even that uh, you do that before you it get installed during the installation of the camera system. Uh, also, uh, also, yeah, you look at uh, so you. So also, you look at your coordinate system. So that does that match um, uh, to your, you know, TPS. Uh, the other system, linear accelerator system, and all these things are. But most importantly, you understand that uh, if any, because often the SGRT is a um, uh, shift data from your uh, R center coordinate, but physicists need to understand that and interpret that correctly in the clinic. So, so you got the system now and you need to commission that. So you need to compile a list of the equipment that you require to perform the commissioning test. And I put few here, there are, I think APM TZ has a, as a, as a list of the images of the phantoms as well. So this mannequin, I find it quite useful. You can test a lot of things. <clears throat> What's important uh, during the choice of uh, equipment is, Make sure they are compatible with your SGRT system. So, can the can the SGRT system track that surface accurately? So that's what you need to look at it. So, have the forty thorax CD phantom or any other phantom that can move up and down. It can program, so you can test dynamic accuracy. It's like you can simply use this variant RGS, um, the motion platform. Also for a calibration, you got uh, uh, this sort of cube where you can, uh, there's a radio pack objects in the center that you can do your MB images or common CT images and set up more accurately and um, perform a calibration uh, to your uh, camera system looking at the surface. Have those um, phantoms ready. Uh, and for end-to-end -end test, a phantom like this, just as an example, um, a state phantom as an example where you can have ability to measure dose. So have those you know, equipment ready. So the first test list from TG147 or 302 is uh, integration of peripheral system. You ensure you, you, your data transfer between uh, in a peripheral systems are accurate. That involves simulation planning, record and verify system, um, they are um, so the patient's information when you transfer from one system to another matches. At our institute, we have variant linear eclipse treatment planning system and mosaic as in record of and verified system, as you can see here. And Align RT system is connected to you know, Linux uh, through MMI. That's what you see when each time you pop up a plan, it shows you. Um, do you want to use LNRT or a Baron RGSC system? So there's no direct connection between LNRT and Mosaic. So one of the 
limitation we found was and when you send a plan from TPS through mosaic to true beam, so there's a patient ID mismatch and because of mosaic does some sort of post-processing of UID and Align RT sees the ID directly from TPS. So you understand that, you understand the ramification of that, you know, potential mistreatment uh, it does that cause. So in our case, um, uh, we understood that and then we made a six in place. Uh, so next up is localization field of view. These, these values given in a table here in the TG302, they are more of you know, indicative values, uh, potentially like a, a largest they can achieve of those systems. For your system, you measure that in a clinic. You try to measure that in a, in a realistic clinical scenario, such as like around the ice center where or wherever the surface tends to be for a, uh, for a sites that you want to employ SGRT system. One of the main issues, so we, we, measure, um, we measure the field of view of our one of our system, and we found something like, 82 centimeter in lateral, uh, 59 centimeter in end post, and around 87 centimeter in the longitudinal direction. But they are specific to your bunker because depending how cameras are installed, um, so and what's the uh, size of your bunker, so they varies from one to another. So, uh, so you you define that clearly during the commissioning. One of the main issue with the field of view is uh, you often have this camera blockage issue. So, however, with these uh, three camera and the advanced camera optimization system uh, with the vision RT, so it seems to perform better. Uh, but you check this, you simulate range of scenario, like you have a plan or you have test scenario involving all the imaging panels open, both MB and KB, Conbeam, CT, uh, then also apply couch kicks and then try to simulate that scenario and, and put a clear uh, restriction where the system cannot be used once you identify those areas. Uh, and also there are, you know, all the strategies you can choose from such as, you know, choice of region of interest to monitor if there are significant um, camera blockage in certain uh, certain aspects. Uh, next test is system stability and reproducibility. Uh, check to ensure when camera becomes stable, once you start up the system, it is more a thermal reflector system. Uh, um, it has to raise to certain temperature condition uh, and then each vendor would have a recommendation on that. So and you, you test these things. Uh, uh, does that uh, and and just uh, make sure when the system becomes stable, thermally stable, and your um, tracking accuracy are stable that you can uh, fully rely on. You, know, you can trust that. So, to, so to test this, um, so I would really suggest to do both uh, short term and long term power outrage scenario, like do something like 20 to 30 minute power off and then they start firing up the power on the system and you start monitoring certain surfaces and then see when you start seeing the, the when the system start to give a stable result. Like you don't want to treat patients around in this steeply, you know, changing uh, situation. So you want to have something like quite nice and flat uh, tracking for a surface. So that's really what you wanna check this time. Uh, have a long-term, something like 24 hour power outrage scenario and then test it in you know, how long it takes for the system to achieve uh, thermal stability at that time so that you, know, you can continue treating. So this sort of recommendation you need to provide to your treatment staff uh, so that you know, they can follow and, and accurately use the system. The reproducibility, reproducibility is the test that you, you, you track some surface over and over again, and does it give you a same value, same results? Next up is <coughs> a static and dynamic localization accuracy. Here you choose range of clinically applicable translation and rotational, rotational surface accuracy. 
for static localization accuracy, have a test plan and set up using SCRT and ensure they are within a millimeter um, and a degree uh, in both transla translation and rotation for SRS type treatment and two millimeter and two millimeter and one degree for non-SRS program. Since we use SCRT to continuously monitor patient and beam hold, when the surface moves outside the predefined tolerances, we need to test its dynamic accuracy. You can use programmable motion phantom such as SARS-40 phantom or variant motion platform with compatible surface attached to track its accuracy. Or simply, you can just have a surface, put it on a couch, move it, uh, and move it, and then does it give you a, uh, a accurate results at the time for moving platform. So SCRT system allows real-time surface imaging that involves, uh, for example, projection of a speckled pattern to the surface and receiving signal back to the sensor and reconstruction of those data and compare the difference from reference surface. It's important to take the temporal response of the system as well as ability to gate the beam in order or determine the system latency. This is one of the area often a lot of people, you know, physicists have questions. Uh, you can do it uh, using a film or if you have access to developer more license uh, and then you are good at uh, programming or writing code, then you can try to uh, simulate um, uh, your couch motion and have some surface so you know exactly in a, you know it's 20 millisecond time where your couch is or where surface is and at what time the beam got held uh, we can we can talk about this during qa if you have a question around this so we tried matching the rpm gating and the align rt gating to test our system's um, temporal response and kind of found out around so 0.3 of a second and 0.2 millimeter of a spatial accuracy in a, in a for the system latency and spatial accuracy for a dynamic phantom. So some of the other consideration you need to do during commissioning is test your system for brains of skin tone color for, for its accuracy. Uh, to track surfaces. Often darker surface absorb more light, giving less signal to reconstruct the surface accurately. Uh, your system may come up with different exposure settings that <clears throat> you can adjust to your camera to accommodate different skin tone. Make sure you cross-validate the, the, the uh, software's performance. A room light condition impact the camera performance, especially too bright light making too much reflection, overwhelming the sensor to receive signal. To ensure you operate in a condition you have calibrated your system for its optimal accuracy. Uh, check the functionality of the features uh, such as um, SSDs features, gated surface capture, uh, also um, ROI metrics or frame rate, you know, like uh, which protocol um, has the highest frame rate. So, how slow or how fast they respond, uh, what sort of size is appropriate so you test that during commissioning uh, the another thing is uh, you said uh, you, you test it depending how you want to use the system uh, so check the check the uh, yeah. surface uh, yeah. surface counter from a treatment planning yeah. system and um, and what sort of Huntsville unit is the most true representative of a uh, of a surface that's recognized in the SGRD system. So I have some phantoms uh, that you know, and then you create a plan, send it. So we found uh, just using a different threshold of the threshold of the uh, Huntsville unit uh, to put a body contour on uh, one of our brand pediatric phantom. So between from minus 150 HU to minus 950 HU, we found up to uh, 3.5 millimeter discrepancy in AP direction. So find out what's what's the the best value for a true surface. Uh, yeah, always operate your uh, always operate your um, system in a calibration conditions like what room light conditions they use during commissioning, and that's where it's meant to provide the optimal performance. So if it deviates. Um, 
uh, then you know you know where the problem is uh, and uh, uh, there are accessories uh, always comes with um, with the system such as real time coach device uh, that where you can track the breathing motion let's say and then coach uh, patients uh, to hold the breath so you test the functionality of those such accessories So next up is end-to-end -end testing. So which follow follow entire radiation therapy chain. So it so you simulate clinical scenarios in the plants that includes all potential treatment conditions, treatment uh, sites, including non-coplanar couch angles. Choose a phantom where you can insert chamber for dose measurement. Then compare the dosimetry result, uh, which should comply with your uh, departmental tolerance. Uh, for that particular uh, technique, uh, let's say if you are implementing SRS uh, open face mask uh, treatment using SGRT, then so like say 3% to 1 millimeter tolerance, especially 1 millimeter and dosimetry wise 3% or up to 5%, whatever your department pro protocol is. So does it comply with that sort of tolerance? So it's, uh, it's really to, uh, and they, they, these this is end-to-end uh, -end testing at the time uh, where you kind of the this is this is the time where you determine the systematic and random error of the systems overall of the overall process. So uh, for a positional um, accuracy, the the tolerance is somewhere around two millimeter to one degree for uh, most of the. Um, uh, most of these sites, so, whereas for SRS, uh, it's one millimeter, one degree. Right. So, and also another thing at this time is just your imaging coincidence and your MB imaging coincidence. Uh, if they happen to do well, then you achieve this sort of tighter tolerance or a very nice agreement. So we use the ST Phantom uh, to do the end-to-end -end testing uh, for one example in our case, uh, where we could measure the dosimetry through a chamber insert. Uh, so, so you do all these tests and um, you, you record what uh, what are the pitfalls of the system. You, you, you note that down. So one of the um, uh, limitation of the SGRD system is you have the limited field of view. So such as it's, so it's quite tricky to treat a uh, CSI case, uh, uh, craniospinal irradiation case, where you have all often have a quite large treatment area, and and you have three three isocentral, let's say. So clearly document those limitations. Uh, the another uh, issues or a limitation with the SCRT system is uh, a skin tone. Sometimes the darker color skin um, patients, you know, you may not get enough information. So. Uh, you you have that um, documented. You have the workaround. Let's say you know setting a or right you know, appropriate uh, exposure setting on a camera system or a software. Uh, if they that provides the accurate uh, tracking accuracy, then that's what you need to write it and clearly communicate to your treatment staff. Uh, material color. Uh, like any any treatment aid equipment such as bolus um, have a compatible color there as well. So because um, we found uh, the uh, we used to have this natural PLA uh, before SCRT system, and then you can see some but probably this color was too bright, and then there's some reflection. Uh, so uh, giving some sort of blacks uh, hollow here, shade here, so not giving much information. And we tested with a few different. Uh, Bolas and and found this matte PLA, so which is more a skin tone color, you know, and that, that seems to work pretty well. Uh, also, any issues during commissioning, you found something like this. So this was the uh, this was the um, the overlay of the contour uh, on a postural video module uh, from a previous patient. Like this cube is uh, from a QA cube, and that's overlaid on a patient. So. Uh, you communicate this to vendor, ask them, you know, what can they do? So when you report these things, um, and that's where they can improve. Uh, so the, another main limitation from SCRD system is you can't correlate your um, uh, external surface to an internal target. So that's always, we need to be aware. That's why IGRD is still a gold standard. Uh, 
uh, and uh, understand, you know, sometimes that when you have the cylindrical uh, surface uh, and symmetrical surface, then uh, two of the camera uh, out of three if CCs and then the other side, and uh, then it often confuses. And so, so you understand that and then you probably try to find to add some or a capture or, or ROI that includes some features that are distinct from one to another so that it can still track that accurately. So documentation, so that's another key, key area that we all need to do it properly. Uh, so at, you do all these tests. Um, you have a uh, when you have a proper documentation in place. Um, you know your tests are documented. Uh, they are they, the methodology are written nicely, and if they can be reproduced, uh, that that's that's really good. Uh, the test results are recorded. Then they can be cross checked by another physicist for any potential error, and and have a hard copy of that record somewhere, uh, so that it's always accessible when needed. Have a comprehensive commissioning report, you know, listing product details, uh, all administrative details um, such as username, password, um, uh, what type of camera it this is, what sort of uh, protocol settings are, what's the software version, what's the serial number, what are the associated accessories it comes with, what are, what are the licensing uh, components are. So have that properly uh, documented uh, so that always you can reference those uh, information. Uh, and, and you update that document as you make if you make any changes, but make sure that's communicated properly. And then you have that change uh, process for a change management. Uh, so that, that's very important that we work in a hospital environment where, you know, um, if we make a small mistake that can lead to some detrimental effect to patient. So we want to avoid that through a proper documentation. So now moving on to next phase, which is a QA. So I'll just briefly go through uh, so what we do at PeterMac and you know what are the recommendations. So this list here, this uh, there are recommendations from TG147 or 302 that uh, you do a daily QA of a safety, which is more about interlocks, communication, and perform a static localization accuracy. So, so this is just to ensure that your systems has not been deviated from your baseline values. So it, it's, it's very important that you have a routine QA checks. So this should be performed by radiation therapist or you know, the radiation therapist normally uh, and in a regular interval like daily, monthly, annually, and, and any when there are any major activities on an ad hoc basis. Uh, so, uh, so these are the list of the tests from TG147, and I'll probably show you some from PETAMAC what we do. So that kind of covers our compliant with TG147. So this daily QA need to be quick, easy to set up and robust. Uh, and and uh, can be performed by radiation therapists or radiation engineering. And that's what we do at our center. The, the daily power cycle is done by radiation therapists. Uh, and these are daily QA behind the recommended looking at the camera relative part position using the plate they provide, um, where we get a tolerance. Uh, often it comes as a default as a one millimeter, but I know uh, this camera, when you have a, a small knock on it, you know, it may move. So you tighten that tolerance based on what can happen. Uh, always review those um, results uh, on a regular interval by physicist and to do the safety check, something like this, where all the system are connected, there are no interlocks. And uh, and another thing is integrate uh, QA if that's possible. So something like this, that's what we did at our center where uh, we made a block that we used to do OBI in QA anyway. So, but this is not visible with the SCRD system. So we made up the, the cap for this where you can uh, track the surface with the SCRD system. So. And while, while you do the OBI, you just check the localization accuracy, uh, just the most movement of a one centimeter of this block from your imaging. And does that 
translate same value to your IGR, uh, SGRT system. And most importantly, we all need to record this um, in a proper record, such as we use a uh, red machine uh, platform uh, to record these things, QA results. So next up is monthly QA. So monthly QA includes uh, safety and static and dynamic localization according to the TG147. Uh, but we incorporate the calibration check as well. And um, and uh, we do some dynamic dose measurement uh, plus camera block as well. So uh, so the uh, so this is directly performed by QMPS or uh, or their supervision. Uh, and uh, we use the this compatible cube. We put it on a um, variant frogs to simulate a motion, so that uh, and then uh, so I didn't show the actual uh, constancy. Those constants we check on a monthly basis of random, which sits around the treatment. Sorry, around the ice center. But it uh, you move, you have this surface somewhere else. And you track it, and then you just say, can your system get the beam while you delivering a uh, dose? Uh, to the hand chamber. Also have the QA of your accessories such as real-time mm, coaching device or uh, uh, any remote if you use. Uh, we don't use this system it, remotes, but it needs to be checked on a monthly basis. But the the I think the SCRT is quite useful to utilize on your Linux QA program. So we employ Winston Lutz based on the um, cube provided by BizNRT, SRS cube that you saw earlier, uh, where you have the BBs in, in the middle. So we, we use that uh, because we already have the images acquired during the calibration process uh, and uh, that saves extra time. Also, you can do the same thing with the six stuff QA of your calcs. Yeah. And, and relate that to your correlate that to your SGRT. So, so, so try to follow or try to integrate as much as possible so that it's more streamlined and it's more efficient QA. So on your QA, so the, these, these are the things we do. So visual inspection of camera, check the coordinate system that's still correct uh, from your initial one. Uh, so we do some functionality, more administrative type of work on a database, uh, look at the arc card register functionality, obviously perform a plate calibration uh, or uh, like if required and perform a daily QA capture, um, monthly static localization accuracy test, you know, gating functionality and dose measurement using a, a arc delivery, real-time codes functionality again, that's part of monthly QA. Uh, and we just um, use a different method to look at the dynamic uh, localization accuracy, matching, looking at the image, um, matching, uh, and combining this with the IGRD system, really, when we do a uh, image of the calibration cube. Uh, and uh, additionally, we do the drift test uh, again. So it's more a short term drift test. Um, uh, that's what we tend to do on an annual basis. And Additionally, end-to-end -end tests should be a part of the annual QA where uh, that's a more uh, program specific, like uh, um, as I said, SRS program or a SBRD program or a breast, you know, uh, VMAT program. So that should be tailored based on your program. Uh, that's where you bring the SGRT in the process and then you do end-to-end -end test as part of annual QA as well. Uh, and additionally, this uh, ad hoc QA, so that's where um, identify physicists need to identify, read the customer bulletins, uh, and also understand what impacts that's going to have. You know, what faults was there uh, to begin with? Uh, what's the potential impact from that fault? And uh, and determine what test it covers. If you don't know, then like you always reach out to others, uh, your colleague. Um, Experience users, uh, vendors uh, for a guidance. Uh, it's always better to ask and uh, and and try to cover as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> um, so we integrated this uh, routine piece uh, PMI, which we do annually for our, our Alan RT cameras, and we actually uh, uh, do our all annual QA after this routine PMI. So it covers most of it. So that's probably where I will stop. And thank you so much for listening.
Thank you so much, Mr. Depart, for the interesting presentation and providing us in detail about the commissioning and QA of the SGRT system. Uh, right now, may I move to the third topic presented by Associate Professor Vanessa Penetri. Uh, let me introduce her to the audience. Professor Vanessa is senior medical physicist, currently working at the Macaram Cancer Center and also associate professor at Monash University. She has contributed to more than 40 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and her current research interests are in predictive modeling, automated planning, and advanced imaging for treatment individualization, including surface-guided radiation therapy. Today, she will share us with the topic of the surface guidance in the clinical applications. Please, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Dr. Supalak, for the kind introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. So the objective of my talk is to take a step further from what Deepak talked to you about and talk to you about the clinical application of surface-guided radiation therapy. So, sorry, I'll take my pointer so that I can point. Uh, I have a few disclosures and acknowledgements. The first one is that until the end of 2022, I was working at Alfred Health Radiation Oncology, still in Melbourne. And this center was pioneering the installation of SGRT in Australasia. So we use the system for more than 10 years. And a lot of the experience today is from that time. And I would like to thank my ex-colleague, Catherine Russell, for a lot of the slides that you're going to see today. But I'm now at Peter McCallum Cancer Center, and I would like to thank uh, my colleague, Karen McGoldrick, and the Peter Mac team for providing their experience in implementing SGRT and another group of slides that you're going to see today. And as you've heard, Peter McCallum has a research collaboration with VisionRT, who is the, one of the vendors of SGRT systems. But let's dive into it. So you've heard it all from Deepak, who brilliantly presented to us how we commission a system that SGRT or surface guided radiation therapy is an emerging non-radiographic technology. So what's the task of this technology? I think we can categorize in two different tasks. One is that it assumes the roles of the clinicians to enable a more robust setup. And I will take it a step further in the next few slides and talk to you about how we can replace the traditional setup method of three-point technique. But it also allows us to track the motion of the patient during the treatment, so to look into intrafraction motion. This is an example of one of the SGRT systems. So you see here, there's a projected light onto the patient's surface, and I will explain to you how we use this projected light. So there are three main commercial systems around the world, at least so far. There is the CRAD Catalyst and Sentinel system, and then the Vision RT, Align RT system, and the Variant Identifier system. There are some developments from other vendors, so I think it is a very interesting field, a field that is um, sort of emerging, and you're going to see more and more of it around the world. So because I've worked mainly with the SGRT system called AlignRT, I thought I would bring it as an example because I'm going to use some of the slides and with um, you know, some of the, the screenshots from AlignRT. But you have to think about the fact that most systems will work similarly. So AlignRT has three ceiling ca mounted cameras. And as Deepak said before, this is an old version of the camera. Now we have new cameras called Horizon, which are a little bit bigger and have other abilities. But what these cameras do is that they project a visible red light with a pseudo-random speckle pattern on the patient. And just as an anecdote, it's very interesting, the reaction of the patient to the red light. You have to tell them that it's going to happen because, as we know, radiation is invisible, but this red light, they think actually it's the radiation sometimes. So you have to tell them what it is. And this is projected from each pod onto the patient. It sort of acquires 2D information, which is then converted into 3D coordinates via triangulation and visualized as a surface rendering, similar to what you see here. This real-time surface is then aligned with the planning CT surface or a reference um, region of interest um, which I will um, explain to you how we acquire these reference captures and the planning CT surface in the next few slides when we talk about the workflow. 
So in which application can we use SGRT? So before I tell you um, the answer to this question, this is a nice screenshot of all the AlignRT systems in, the, in, the, in our area, and so in the Asia Pacific. And you can see that there is quite a few around that, this area. Actually, if we think about the entire world, there's more than 1,000 systems. So it is definitely an emerging technology. But where can we use it? In which part of the body? I want to convince you by the end of my talk that you can actually use SGRT in most treatments. So let's start from the first task of the SGRT system, which is SGRT as setup tool. So for me, it's like looking at SGRT as our new eyes, the eyes of the clinician. In Australia, for example, all the setup is done very um, expertly by our radiation therapist, and this system becomes their eyes. So how do we set up the patient? Initially, we have to acquire a body contour of the patient from the planning CT, which is sent via DICOM to the sort of SGRT system. What I wanted to tell you, and it's important that you keep in mind, is that often the body contour that you have in your planning is a body contour that includes accessories. So in order to just track the, the patient and not the accessories, you have to create another surface, which is often you know, labeled as SGRT surface and send that one to the SGRT system. Once you have sent your surface, you see here, this is the body, like the pink one, you can define your uh, region of interest. How do you define this region of interest? Well, it depends on the treatment site that you're gonna be treating and tracking and monitoring. It is a very crucial step in your setup and also monitoring of the patient. You have to think that the SGRT systems are not coping very well with surfaces that don't have any definition. So for example, for this mannequin, in order to have a tracking that is you know, accurate or as accurate as possible, I would probably add a little bit of the side of the patient in order to have that feature. So once you have a region of interest, then the system calculates displacement in six degrees of freedom, like you see here. And what is interesting for you to know is that it doesn't matter if you have a six degrees of freedom couch or a four degrees of freedom couch in your institute. This is done independently on your couch system. So it's really nice if you only have a, a four off couch to have another system which tells you what the pitch and roll of your patient are. And you can use that to position your patient before you're doing your IGRT. So this um, sort of real-time deltas, as we call them, so these displacements can be tracked in real time. So you can monitor the patient and you can track them within what we call the thresholds. And Deepak has nicely alluded to the fact that the thresholds are usually defined during commissioning. And for me, this is a very interactive process. So it needs to be done in the multidisciplinary team and also needs to be reviewed like after a while that you've been using the system if you think some thresholds are not achievable or if you could relax them. The thresholds are important because once the patient goes out of thresholds, and I will show you a picture after of the sort of this little block being becoming red, the beam is held there are options for which you can decide not to help to hold the beam, but often these systems are used with the option of beam holding. So there are some other nice features that you can have with your SGRT system. So for example, some of these SGRT systems have what we call the video function. The video function is what the name says. So it's a video of the patient on the couch. You see, this is the patient and overlaid to the patient, you have this lines which come from the body contour that you've sent from the planning system. Why is this really beneficial? And I can tell you this tool, which is called postural alignment, is a game changer for some treatment sites because you can actually position parts of the body that might not be exactly in the treatment field. Like, for example, chin, the arms of the patient, you can position that with the postural alignment before you start doing any radiation for imaging. Another nice features of this system is that they allow you to have uh, an idea of what is the SSD instead of having to measure it um, with your you know, ODI. So what is a typical workflow for us and for most centers that are using this technology? So that, you know, in a way, uh, you starting by setting up the patient on the couch as you would do um, in without the SGRT system and then using the DICOM surface and that body contour and ROI that you've defined 
from um, your, your CT scans, you first adjust the rotations, and then you can move the patient to position using the translations, either manually or automatically. What I can tell you is this, this is very center specific. Some centers would do the contrary. They would drive the patient according to the translations and then sort of modify the rotation. So that's why I put a little arrow here for you to know. What is the advantage of this? Most of this can be done with very little manual handling from the radiation therapist. Um, and this was very beneficial, for example, during the COVID pandemic, where there was, you know, we were trying to keep ourselves away from the patient as much as possible. But there are many more advantages. And I thought in order to describe these advantages, I would just tell you what anatomical sites we can treat with the aid of SGRT. I said the aid of SGRT. So it needs to be very well understood that SGRT is an extra tool in your arsenal. So let's start from, I think, one of the most important sites where we can use this technology, thorax and breast in particular, and pelvis and abdomen. So I think it's important, especially when we think about breast treatment, to go back to what is the usual way in which we set up the patients. So the traditional way of setting up the patients. So we know that the traditional way of setting up the patients relied on external surrogates to reproduce the setup position and localize the isocenter placement. So how do we position traditionally our placing? By using these external marks. The external marks can be either placed on the patient's skin or they can be placed on the immobilization device. And they use as in, for the initial alignment as a surrogate for the isocenter. And they use in combination with the room lasers. And that's why it's very important that the physicists in in the department have those lasers very well calibrated and kept up to date. And, and these marks, usually we don't use only one mark on the patient, we use up to three marks, should give the coordinates in 3D. Now, in the past few years, this method of positioning the patients with marks has been slowly being replaced by the use of SGRT. And I think it's interesting if we look at the publication in the field of the last few years, you see that there's been a peak of publication since 2015. And this is because there's been a peak in installation of this technology in the departments and people have started to take the leap and gone towards the use of what we call skin mark free technique. Here you have some nice references and this is a very um, uh, nice reference that is included in the surface guided radiation therapy book which is a book that came out a few years ago that is all dedicated to SGRT. So it's, it's a good book if you want to start that technique. Why is it important to eliminate the mask? And I had to leave this slide in because for the patient having a mark on your skin in particular, let's forget about the immobilization device, can be a very traumatic experience. And there are patients that seek to go and get treated somewhere else if they can't have a skin mark free types of treatment. There are even websites where you can put your postcode and it will tell you which centers are doing a skin mark free technique, which centers as SGRT can do it. And for example, if you put our postcode in Melbourne, you will see the Peter McCallum and the Alfred come up as centers where you can have this technique. So we know what are the issues with marking. For the tattoos, obviously, it's one of the worst case because the tattoos are permanent. They can have potential negative body impact. They can be a problem for OHNS for the patients. They can be difficult to see in some skin types. They can bleed and they can also become unsightly. If they bleed, for example, you see here how the accuracy of your positioning can be sort of compromised. The similar, um, similarly, you could say to me, yes, but we can drop the tattoos and use like, you know, temporary skin markings, even those which are usually done with texture pens can actually be a burden for the patient to maintain. And they have to be remarked continuously during the treatment. So that setup process becomes much longer. All of this can be sort of avoided if we have SGRT. So let's see what are the advantages. So with the skin marks, you have limited information about the specific point or the points on the patient's surface. It's just the point. 
And it's more difficult to provide information about nearby anatomy, like the chin and the limbs that we were talking about before. Those are very important, especially if you're treating more than one isocenters. Um, if you have SGRT, you can use many thousands of virtual reference points across an area of interest. So you're tracking that surface in six degrees of freedom and not only in three degrees of freedom like you were doing with your marks. Also, as the skin is movable, sometimes the skin mark points can be manipulated, deforming their relationship, and that can affect rotation. Now you have all these tools, you have your real-time deltas, but you also have video functions that allow you to see the patient in 3D views and correct those rotations. It is not, for some, has not been an easy process to move to remove the marks. And I think that's why I put this picture here because it's a little bit of a leap, but I can show you two examples of where centers have done it and they have done it in a way for which now they're very happy because the results are that these uh, positionings are as accurate or more accurate than the traditional methodology. One example that I like to bring up is the example of Peter McCallum Cancer Center. So the yeah, Peter Mac, we went live with SGRT without skin marks from day one. And this was a choice of training the staff to do this type of technique from day one without having to rely on the marks. And I think it was a very, very intelligent way to go towards the use of SGRT because the radiation therapist learned during their training how to do this type of um, sort of positioning. And the conclusion of this nice work, which was presented by Kenton Thompson as the SGRT community, and here you have the reference, is that uh, by looking at quite a large number of fractions, I think it was about 800 fractions. Sorry, I can't see it because I have some controls on my screen. Um, what they've seen is that the tattoo and mark free with aligner T improved the mean vector displacement compared with the conventional three point localization for breast patients. So this is a very interesting result. Not only we've taken away that mark, which is a problem psychologically for a patient, but we might have also made, and we have in some cases, that treatment more accurate. Another nice example that I like to bring up is the example of the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. At the Alfred, we went um, without the skin marks from 2018. And we are not for the patients that were treated in the abdomen and pelvis. And we analyzed after, after three years, about 5,000 fractions, and we saw the same. So we saw that abdomen pelvis radiotherapy setup using SGRT without the skin marks has a similar accuracy to tattoo and skin marks. So if you decide to go to SGRT, I will urge you to consider maybe thinking about removing the marks, but do your work, like analyze your data and be sure that you know, your accuracy is the same or better than what you had before. But it's important that you remember that in all of my talk, I'm ne never saying that SGRT is replacing the image-guided radiation therapy. It's an aid to image-guided radiation therapy. You still have to do your radiographic imaging in order to position your patients in the treatment area around the tumor. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that you can use SGRT to remove the skin marks but let's move on and look at what you can do after you've set up your patient. So what are the next step in our workflow? So you've moved your patient, patient is in position, and you have all your values within tolerance. At this point, we tend to take a new reference capture. It's, a, it's an important step because then you have all your delta starting at zero. And taking this reference capture is often done in two different ways. If your patient breathing is quite um, small, you can actually take a static capture. If your patient breathing is a little bit larger, you can use a tool called gated captures in which you can acquire 30 images over 10 seconds and do an average so that you control better your breathing because that could actually bring you out of your tolerances. After this, once you you know, you've taken your reference capture, you can proceed to the, your pretreatment verification. So this comes, your IGRT now comes into play as you've done standardly until now. So you take your ComBeam or you take your KV. And once you've taken your ComBeam or your KV or your MV, whatever you want to do, you can uh, correct the couch positions. At this point, you need to retake 
is another reference capture because most likely your patient has moved a little bit. And so it's important that you retake that reference capture to get your values back within the thresholds. What is interesting is that if you do in this process, you're going to see that your deltas are going out of um, tolerance, or in some cases, they're not out of tolerance, but they move. Even if, you know, sometimes the tumor is very deep so, and there is no correlation between the internal structure and the external surface, but you still see that the external surface has moved because in reality, what we do is that we move the couch. We don't move the tumor. All right, so once you've taken your new reference capture after the correction with imaging, you have, you're ready to monitor the patient during the treatment. And I think this is a wonderful feature that we have with SGRT. Before you had the RT or whomever was present at the treatment, looking through the screen, making sure the patient wouldn't move. Now we have a system that can actually track every single motion. And we, in 10 years of using this system, we've discovered that patient move more than we think. And this is very interesting. Okay, so Nick has talked to you about breath holds. So I'm not gonna tell you what breath hold is for, but I can tell you that the SGRT systems have also been designed to gate the beam in predetermined positions. And this is done both for the IBH, so deep inspiration breath hold, which is generally used for breast treatment and for some other treatment like lung, and for end expiration breath hold, which is often used for liver treatments. So the way we do it with SGRT is that we acquire two planning CT, one in free breathing and one in the breath hold position. The free breathing um, scan is used to create a body contour that it's useful for us in order to position the patient initially. So to do the initial daily setup, why do we need it? Well, there's a lot of debate that we could do without it, but you have to think it might take a while to position your patient on the couch. You don't want the poor patient to be in breath hold all the time where you try to position it. So it's better to position in free breathing and then go to the breath hold uh, scan and use it for imaging and treatment delivery so that we don't tire the patient out. This is just um, to show you that we can use real time uh, li little coaching devices for the patient so that the patient knows in which position they are. Some patients cope really well with these devices. Some patients find them very stressful. So again, it depends on the patient. Okay, another interesting application or at least a use of SGRT is using SGRT as an aid for SABER or SBRT. I used both words here, sorry. I should have used one, but just to, to tell you that it can use, be used with stereotactic body radiation therapy. So we know, and we've heard it before, that IGRT has been our silver bullet in order to enable the use of SBRT or SABER in many anatomical sites using a variety of radiographic images. So, and this is indisputable. IGRT still needs to be done. But the real-time nature of IGRT can allow for several enhancement to the standard IGRT process. So SGRT can complement, or in some cases augment the existing IGRT workflow. And it can address some of the limitation of IGRT. So IGRT in most centers has a static nature, unless you're doing tumor tracking, but let's say very few centers have machines that allow tumor tracking. While with SGRT, we can continuously monitor the patient during the treatment. I know that we're monitoring the surface, we're not monitoring the tumor, but in some cases, at least we know if there is a big change in the patient position. SGRT allows us also to account for those postural changes, which are very difficult to account for with IGRT because we're not looking in the entire area um, and we're not looking at other ROI, for example. And of course, there is the advantage that IGRT is non-ionizing and so we can use it continuously during the treatment, which is something that we can't do with IGRT. Okay, so I hope you can still hear me because I got a little notice that I have little resources, but uh, stop me if you can't. But the next interesting body site that I wanted to talk about is obviously the head and neck and brain. Um, I think SGRT here is a big game changer, in particular in relation to moving us closer to removing the treatment mask. 
or at least moving part of the treatment mask. As you know, the radiotherapy mask is one of the experiences that for some of the patient can become the worst part of the radiotherapy. I've put in some sort of references that are very interesting and talk about the anxiety for the patients. So in order to use SGRT, in order to track the head and the head and neck, so the brain and the head and neck, we actually need a little surface, which means that we need to remove part of the mask, which is a big advantage for patients that are claustrophobic. There is work in order that some centers are doing to remove completely the mask, but you know that's a big leap and you need to be very cautious when you're doing that. So this is a nice slide from Karen in which she shows the experience at Peter Mac in using open face mask for neuro SRS, so for stereotactic treatments. And the advantage of having SGRT is you can do it in a non complainer setting. So you can track the patient when the couch moves and after the couch has moved. And, and you see here the little ROI, you're tracking that ROI of the patient. So usually you include the nose and you include a little bit of the eyes and that area. So it's important that you do your research and decide what type of uh, stabilization you want to use for these patients. And you look at all the different options for open face mask and you choose the one that goes well with your, you know, sort of setup. This is what's used at Peter McCallum, which is the CDR stabilization with the Freedom X board, which is this one. A personalized head and neck foam support using the intuition click and a CDR open face dual layer mask, which was tested um, extensively before being used for this purpose. So what happens is similar to what you've seen before. You position the patient, and I can tell you for experience that it's often easier to position the patient without the mask by using the postural alignment, if you have it, and then put the mask and do just the fine adjustments using the real-time deltas, and then you can obviously proceed to take your imaging and do the correction as you would have done anyway. And then you can do your tracking of the patient during the treatment. So you're monitoring. In some centers, we have gone a step further and we have also started to use open face mask for head and necks. So for all the other treatments of the brain, sorry, for like gliomas, but also for head and neck treatments. This is an example of an open face mask with also the open chest. And in some centers like Peter McCallum, open face masks are also used for pediatric patients and you, you can understand the implications of that. Finally, my, one of my last slide is, we can think about SGRT also an excellent tool for some interesting parts of the body like body extremities. And this is a nice slide from Karen again, in which she says that SGRT is a total game changer for managing extremities. Think about before you had to put your patient, you had to image, re-image, and re-image. Now you have the ability to correct pitch and roll and rotation prior to your SGRT. And, and this is certainly nothing to be underestimated. So you're reducing the dose to the patient and most likely you're also reducing the time on the treatment couch, which can be difficult for a patient. Like if you have an arm like this patient here, keeping that position for a long time can be really painful sometimes. This is another example. This is a sarcoma in the posterior type. So you see how this area was tracked. So SGRT allows you also to use um, the system with feet towards the gantry. You don't have to have a specific position. You can use as long as you have your surface to track. So I hope, and this is my last final slide, sorry, I can't move on course. Oh, sorry, I don't know what's happening. Okay, this is my last slide. I hope I've convinced you that if you have SGRT, it's definitely uh, worth thinking about all the application, but maybe one day SGRT will be standard on our LINAC and we will all be using it as a standard of care. So thank you very much for your attention. And you see here, you have my email. So feel free to email me for any other questions that you have, maybe tomorrow when you're thinking about it. Thank you. Bye. Um, thank you, Professor Vanessa, for the great presentation and providing us a guidance for the SGRT application. Okay, we come to the final topic of the webinar. 
uh, given by Professor Thomas Kahn. Let me introduce him again. Professor Kahn now is the Director of Physical Science. He holds academic appointments at Wollongong, IMIT, and Melbourne University. He has an interest in the education of medical physicists, dosimetry of ionizing radiation, image guidance, and clinical trials demonstrated by 100 invited conference presentations and more than 300 papers in reference journals. Today, he will share us with the topic of dose in image guidance. Please, Professor Khan. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm just sort of changing the lighting here a bit uh, and so you can see me. Uh, and I hope more importantly that you can see my screen uh, here, which should give you uh, the title of the presentation, Dose in Image Guidance. Uh, I would also uh, like to acknowledge the tradition and honors of the land on which I'm uh, currently presenting. Uh, and uh, I would also uh, excuse all Australian participants here, uh, because some of you may know that at the moment, uh, the Australian national team, the women's team in soccer plays uh, for the third place in the World Soccer World Cup. So this is an important event and uh, it is probably an event for many Australians which is more important than those in image guidance. So I still I would like to just go to my proper presentation here and uh, just a second, uh, oh, too many screens open. Uh, closing this. Yeah, here we go. Uh, and uh, I would like to, to start off by thanking also Delore Hossein, Colin Martin and George Nentas. Uh, and uh, this is sort of reflecting really uh, the major groups I'm working with, uh, which is in addition to the declaration of yeah. conflicts of interest, uh, which uh, are related. Uh, can, uh, can you still see the slides? Yes. Good. That oh, is... the, right now it's not slide, it's just later, the Google page. Oh, you can only see the Google page. All yeah. right. Yes. Then I might, that, that is obviously not helpful. I thought something might happen here. So let me just go back 